Okay. So actually, I think when this catches up with me, we actually already did this slide. This was the last slide we left on. And as I was driving to work today, or just any time, I guess don't, like, if you're out walking in the courtyard and you feel like a wind go past you, you're like, you're like dude, where are you going, um, gas particles? <laughs> so basically what they're doing is going from a high pressure to a low pressure. So if you have your back to the wind, kind of think, and we're going to see that this is a, needs to have a little more explanation, but kind of think that the, behind you is the high pressure, in front of you is the low pressure. That's why wind does what it does. That's why wind is just air relocating, and this is why it relocates. Um, and so we're going to look more at weather maps, but um, this weather map has the pressure in millibars. 110 millibars, sorry, 1,010 millibars, 1,000 millibars, 990 millibars. You know, and clearly we're stepping, what, down, right, in pressure, okay? So I could put an H here, and I could put an L here. Does that kind of make sense? That's kind of what we got going on here. So then the blue lines, and again, this is going to have to, I'm going to kind of change this up just a little bit, but the blue, the blue lines would represent where wind is going from high to low, high to low, high to low, high to low. I don't know. Did you guys get some of the wind that uh, I guess Quincy was saying 50 miles per hour last night? It was, crazy was it? We didn't get that up in Burlington. Not that much Not anyway. That high, but it was pretty bad. Like my downstairs screen door like flung open and smashed against my door. Ugh. Not like we didn't just have high winds, right? A few days ago. Well, wind this is only this is why wind does what it does. Okay? Why air does what it does and we call it wind. Um, now, one of the things, and I want you to kind of get a fix on this, is if you see, um, if you see down here, if you see kind of the, these lines right here of equal pressure are called isobars. That's on this slide. This is an isobar. This is an isobar. This is an isobar. All it means is that, for instance, if we choose the 1,004 millibars, all of these locations, if I, would, if I could read the barometric pressure, would be 1,004. It's like a starting line. Okay, those are isobars. So these are relatively tight isobars. Okay, the spacing is literally tight. And if the spacing is literally tight, then that means you don't have to go very far, in this case, to get a four millibar change. A little bit, four millibar change. It's like, um, no, it's like, um, it's like falling off a steep cliff instead of kind of falling off a hill. Over there on the left, Okay, these are wide spacing, okay, over here, okay. These are, instead of tight isobars, these are, I'll just call them wide isobars, or wide spacing. And that means that you're definitely still going to have air relocate from a high to a low pressure, but it's not going to be as strong. Okay. Okay. So remember back when we talked about humidity, that's the water vapor in the air, and we talked about the feels like temperature when it's muggy outside. Okay, basically we combine what your thermometer says versus the humidity in the air, and we kind of looked it up on a table, and where they cross, that actually is the heat index. Okay, that's the feels like temperature heat index. This is your other feels like temperature, and actually we're going to go out to today's, um, what the probably the airport is giving us, with regard to temperatures, and we're going to see that this feels like temperature actually is the wind chill effect. It's another feels like temperature. Um, and so you probably are familiar with this. Okay, so basically what happens, the reason we feel colder when it's windier is that, um, and sometimes I'll draw a little diagram of an arm, the reason we feel colder, this is my arm. It's like a Homer Simpson arm, okay? One of the things about your skin is that we have a layer of, I don't know about your fingers, but definitely your arms. We have a layer of thermal energy. I'll just put IR for thermal energy, okay? We, we, try, we just count on basically a little heat aura. Now, if you get a big old wind coming along, basically there goes your heat aura, okay? I don't care if you're bundled up, basically it'll take, it'll take what it can rob from you downstream, the stronger the wind is. 
So that's why we feel colder than, than, um, than it really is. So let's take a look at... Need to break out of here. Duplicate slideshow and go to the internet. So one of the things, there's a lot of things in meteorology that I don't have to time to go over. One of them is like, well, how do they get, like when you go to the internet and it tells you what the current conditions are, where in the heck does that information come from? And usually it comes from a place near an airport. There are these, the, the F, the FAA has um, worked with the government, I guess. It's kind of a joint venture where airports basically need to know wind speed, wind direction. You know, they need to know cloud, you know, ceiling height and all that stuff. Um, so they, uh, a lot of that stuff is just automatically sent in these things called ASOSs which just are they're just automated uh, weather observing systems. Really? I did everything right this time. Ugh. It like blanks me out because I don't know. You have to d duplicate the slideshow and then it allows you to see stuff other than PowerPoint. I gotta see if I can change those default settings. Those are awful. Otherwise, it doesn't let you see anything but PowerPoint. If you go back to PowerPoint, I am going to scream. Alright. I've got another idea. Because what used to work is now not working. And that's like the opposite of science. What works should always work. I'm going to end the slideshow. Nope. That's not right. I can see it on my PC, but it's not coming through. Well, drat. Maybe it doesn't like that. Maybe it'll work now. Because that was something different. Okay, stay. I've come up with a term for, like, if you're teaching and stuff like this and you count on technology working, it's called technology redundancy, where basically the, 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 the really more that you really need to work, the more you just need to duplicate that technology. <laughs> so anyway, I think I know why this wasn't working. So um, current conditions, these are relatively up to date. So this is probably taken um, out of the airport, and actually you can go online and kind of find historic information for that same like little observing station if you want. Um, but notice that the thermometer is saying 53 degrees Fahrenheit, and the feels like temperature is less than that. It's 49 degrees. I've already looked at that, but you can tell on that little chart in your PowerPoint slide that had wind chill effects. But actually, if you look, the temperature 53 is not there. It's not cold enough, basically, to start the whole wind chill, okay? Um, but let's say this was, um, let's back this down to be 33. If this was 33 degrees Fahrenheit, I'm going to pull up the PowerPoint slide, I'll get here in a minute. If this was 33 degrees Fahrenheit, and the thing you need to look at is the wind, here we go, 15 miles per hour. So what you do is you find uh, 33, I think it's along the Y, I guess 33 is along the X at the top, and a wind speed of 15 miles per hour, and where they intersect, that's your wind chill. Now before we go back to that, because this is so hard to get to, let's point out a few other things about the current conditions. So we've been talking about pressure, gas pressure, okay? Notice, um, remember the other day I brought a gold little barometer in here, 
And basically, if the pressure is rising, that means fair skies. If the pressure is falling, that means you could have some sort of condensation or clouds. So the tendency is right here. See this little arrow pointing up? Okay. That means that the pressure is rising, so we're hoping for clearing skies. Okay, so that's kind of how that works. Um, okay. So we said 33 degrees Fahrenheit and 15 miles per hour. Let's see how you would read that. So it's looking like At the top here, we have 40, 35, 30. So somewhere in here, somewhere here between here would be 33 degrees Fahrenheit. And then we go down to 15 miles per hour. So the feels like temperature, let's just go for, well, well I'll say the feels like temperature would be somewhere between 25 and 19. That's what it feels like. Now, one thing, if you're like, now, how does that work with freezing water? Well, water freezes only with what your thermometer says. Water doesn't care about wind. It'll freeze faster probably, okay, but it does not care about wind. So it, the, the wind chill effect does not make water freeze faster. The wind chill effect does not affect how cold your radiator feels, okay, because it's inanimate. Your radiator does not, well, it kind of does, but it doesn't have an ongoing heat blanket around it. So just for kicks, let's go ahead and say, well, what if it was a mild 20 degrees Fahrenheit and you'd be like, that's not mild. Well, you guys know that like at the end of December, 20 degrees Fahrenheit, you're like, oh, bring it on. What if it was 20 degrees Fahrenheit, but it was blowing at 40, we had wind at 40 degrees or 40 miles per hour. Okay, so really what it would feel like is negative one. Okay, so we all know that. So that's the wind chill effect. The other feels like temperature. So there's two feels like temperatures. There's one with humidity, heat index, and there's one with wind, the wind chill. So way back when we talked in our first unit, we talked about Newton's three laws of motion. And one of them is that an object, it's his first law, basically an object in motion will stay in motion unless acted upon by an outside force. So wind is literally air relocating. So wind is air in motion. So that air is going to stay in motion unless something else changes it. Now with regard to wind moving here um, in our weather systems, there are two things that can change the wind, okay? One of them is the force of friction. So we're all kind of a little familiar with the force of friction. You might consider it like a drag force, and it is, okay? So basically, the force of friction can slow wind down. Okay, makes sense. Um, one of the things that's interesting to think is what would our weather patterns be like if we were just like a water world? Okay, water brings a lot less friction than land and or mountains. Okay, mountains brings a lot of friction. Okay, so we would definitely have different weather patterns then. This is, I like this because do you see in, actually in the layer of the earth that the air, the atmosphere that's closest to the earth's surface, that's called, we call it the troposphere. Within the troposphere, wind gets faster as you go up and it's just a function of this friction, okay? So I like this little figure because it's kind of showing you that. So here up at upper elevations, we have really fast wind and then it slows down. And then here near the earth's surface, we kind of have these little eddies. Haven't you ever seen like a Walmart sack go up and then, I mean, like trash or something go up and fall down? You're like, oh, that is so cool, I think. Well, the other thing that changes the direction that wind flows, and I'm going to spend a few slides talking about this, or maybe just two, is something called the Coriolis force. Now, one of the rules for the Coriolis force, or Coriolis force, Coriolis effect, it's the same thing, is that it only works on large moving um, it could be air, which is wind, or it could be large moving volumes of water, sort of fluid. So to kind of put a scale on it, do you see where actually right here, this is the, uh, the one hemisphere of the Earth. Looks like a hat. This is one hemisphere of the Earth. So basically we're saying about half the size of the Earth. If you take a chunk of air and move it, it's going to have the Coriolis force is going to affect it. The Coriolis force is actually caused because the Earth is spinning. Um, I'll try to convince you of that. So the Coriolis force and Coriolis effect are the same thing. It's always a capital C. It must be uh, some dude.
figured it out, Mr. Coriolis. Okay. Um, so if you go back to the kind of the hat figure, the hemisphere that was on the previous slide, could you see where a actually the arrow was kind of deflecting this way? So this was kind of your hemisphere, okay, and it was going choo, okay. That's what we call to the right. That's to the right. I get my rights and left lefts mixed up. I'm getting better at it, okay. Okay, but air is deflected to the right because of this Coriolis force, or Coriolis effect, in the northern hemisphere. Okay, in the southern hemisphere, actually, it's deflected to the left. But I think we're just going to concentrate on the northern hemisphere. To the right. So the Earth is spinning. Now, I've got three little figures here. You've got three figures on the slide. These first two figures kind of go together. Now, here's the deal. We're going to take something at the North Pole, and we're going to send it along one line of longitude. So it's going along line of longitude A. It is, but it isn't. It's in the air, OK? Air is in the air. <laughs> OK, so this is not on the Earth's surface. The Earth is rotating underneath that trajectory thing, OK? So here we go. So it takes off along um, what we call longitude A. The Earth spins counterclockwise. Can you see the counterclockwise? OK, we're looking down at the North Pole, and it is going this way, OK? So um, here's North America here, and here's North America here. North America is swinging around counterclockwise. So remember, it's in the air, OK? It takes off on longitude A and ends on longitude B. It's kind of cool, and it kind of makes sense. It's like the Earth is spinning underneath it, right? All right. So how does that actually mean deflection to the right? And here we go. Actually, somebody who was watching that object move saw it start off on A and end on longitude B it saw it actually swing around. And it's actually, we use the word apparent, appears, it's kind of a faux <laughs> sort of thing. Okay, it's an apparent deflection to the right. Can you see the right thing going on there? To the right, swinging to the right in our, in our hemisphere. So that's the Coriolis force or Cor Coriolis effect. Again, it only works on large chunks of air or water, okay? And it's strongest at the poles, and, this, and it's, it's a spinning sort of thing, and this spinning sort of thing actually near the equator, it, there's no effect, okay, near the equator. This, the Coriolis force, is one of those myths <laughs> that's out there. Have you ever ho heard that if you were, like, kidnapped and um, you only got to use, um, or you were able to use a toilet, if you were kidnapped and got to use a toilet, you didn't know which hemisphere you were in, you're like, what does that mean? Actually, the myth goes something like this. You could flush the toilet and see which way it goes down. If it goes um, counterclockwise, you're in the northern hemisphere. If it goes clockwise, you're in the southern hemisphere. Okay, if you never heard that, it's out there. And I think the Mythbusters actually had looked into this. The problem, and, and there's something to be said for this, because in the northern hemisphere, large bodies of water go actually um, uh, counterclockwise, and in the southern hemisphere, large bodies of water like that would go um, clockwise in the southern hemisphere. So there's something to be said for that. But your toilet bowl is just not enough space to actually get the Earth's rotation involved in it spinning. Um, more than likely, you will see kind of clockwise or counterclockwise as, as water goes down your toilet, but it's because of kind of the, the, the way your toilet was molded, kind of how it makes stuff go down. So there you go. Now you know. So last two slides, I kind of want to revisit these, um, these H's and L's on, the, um, on your weather maps. So um, we said H stands for a high pressure, okay? Um, and remember we said, um, or I, I said it kind of in passing maybe, but if you see a, a big old H on a weather map, a lot of times you're going to see these contour lines. These are my contour lines marking locations with the same pressure, okay? And then I would actually have like, oh, I don't know. Let's go ahead and write some. If this was 1,004, okay, if it's high, we're stepping down. This could be 1,000 millibars, okay? And I guess this would be, what, 1,008 millibars. 
Okay, so that's kind of what we have going on with regard to a, a middle, what we call a middle or central high pressure. Um, this is actually, anytime you see this, we call it an anticyclone. So weathermen might be saying we're under the influence of an anticyclone. All they mean is a high pressure. Okay. So in our hemisphere, and that's opposite in the other hemisphere, but in our hemisphere, we're actually going to see wind blowing generally clockwise. Can you kind of see what that's trying to show you? These little, these little things are kind of showing wind blowing clockwise around a central high. Um, like the slide says, if the weatherman says anti-cyclone in place, then you can kind of imagine it's going to be kind of uh, wimpy weather. Those isobars are not going to be very tight, not much wind. Oftentimes the skies are going to be clear. So I am all for an anti-cyclone, quite frankly. Okay. Um, yeah. So an anti-cyclone. Now, one other thing. Do you remember when I said the whole candy thing? Remember when I said, um, let's see, what did I do? I said the oh, I know. I did stink bomb and candy, didn't I? On the same playground. Let's go ahead and do that way. Okay. So I said, if you, if you throw a stink bomb in the middle of, uh, which you should never do, a crowded, uh, <laughs> a crowded playground with lots of kids, well, those kids are naturally going to run from the stink bomb. Okay? And actually, that's kind of what we have going on with the central high pressure. What do we know about wind? It's going to go from high to low. So we kind of have a migration of material out of that central high. Okay. So um, the air at high at the high is what we call diverging. The word diverging just simply means moving out. Ah, moving out. Dee -dee 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 -dee. Okay. So it's moving out. Okay, and it kind of as it moves out, it creates a an empty space, a vacuum. So what it's replaced with is actually it's kind of fun. Kind of a column of air from upper elevations goes down. Okay, so the air moves out, the column of, of, of upper air comes down. And one of the things, we didn't talk much about air coming down, but air coming down actually is going to be heated up. So it's going to be nice and warm and toasty and dry. Okay, so that's kind of what we have going on here. So a column of air coming down, just for that reason. All right. Well, let's look at those L's. Oops. So anticyclones bring clear skies light winds, if any, and generally warm conditions. Okay. Um, while I'm thinking of it, a lot of times, um, and one of the things we aren't going to get talk, talk to talk about are kind of these upper level winds, and these upper level winds kind of go like, kind of go, they have kind of this wavy sort of pattern we call Rossby waves, and a lot of times it will alternate um, high, and then we'll have a low, and then we'll have a high, Okay, so you kind of alternate patterns if the wind's kind of doing this nice little big old wavy thing. Now, those waves I've drawn there, oh my gosh, those waves are about the depth of North America. That's about how big, excuse me, that's about how big those waves are. Okay, the last one, last slide then, instead of um, central H, we have a middle or central L. So that would be called a central low pressure. That is actually what we call a cyclone. Now, we are going to get to uh, talking about uh, tornadoes. Um, I looked at the schedule, and so we've got today's lecture. We've got tomorrow's lab. We've got today's lecture, Friday's lecture, Monday's lecture, and then the following Monday's lecture, and the following Wednesday's lecture. So we've got quite a few days. So we'll get, we'll get to tornadoes, I promise, one way or the other. But if you've ever heard a tornado called cyclone, maybe, okay, the Iowa State cyclones, right, uh, tornado alley sort of thing. Oh, sorry. <laughs> I didn't mean to bring up hard, hard feelings here. <laughs> um, but uh, the thing about tornadoes is they also have an L, kind of a central low pressure, very tight central low pressure. Um, so anyway, so these would be lows. Now notice that actually you see, maybe you see wind going, uh, what we say, counter clockwise around a low, okay, uh, what else, counterclockwise around a central low, I'll put both of these up here, 
Okay, so a central low, so if that's a low, and let me go ahead and draw some isobars on here. The thing about central lows is they are notorious, I'll pick purple to be my isobars this time. Lows are notorious for having isobars that look very much like a tight little bullseye. Okay, so those are my isobars. And one of the things we said is if you see isobars that are close together, this is one of the things I'd like you five years from now when you're looking at a weather map say, oh my gosh, those isobars are awfully tight. I bet there's going to be some wind associated with that. Okay, and there generally is. Um, so uh, if this is a low, let's go ahead and put this at, let's make it a really low low. So we'll go 996 nine, millibars, and let's go ahead and increments of 4 millibars. So the next one would be 1,000 millibars, and then 1,004 millibars, and then, oops, 1,004 millibars, and 1,008 millibars, and 1,016 millibars. Goodness. <laughs> okay. <coughs> So you should expect some sort of definite wind as I've drawn those isobars. Okay, so if, if wind is generally, and I know wind end up, ends up going counterclockwise, but that's because the Coriolis force makes it do that, and I'm not going to try to convince you of that. But in general, we have air that is um, converging now, okay? So this would be the candy scenario. Okay, so converging air. What, why do I mean that? Well, I have a high to a low, high to a low, converging air. It's the candy effect on the playground. Okay, so what happens if we have um, air kind of meeting there? Okay, well, it's piling up, and where it's going to go, again, is, has to do with what's happening a lot. Actually, this air is going to ascend. Okay, the column of air, just like I said here, uh, column of air is going to move up. And actually, one of the, we said that if you can get a chunk of air rising, we said that it's going to get larger. Remember I said that those weather balloons start out like this, and they get the size of a house? It's going to get larger, and it's going to cool down. So that chunk of air that's rising is going to get larger, and it's going to cool down. And if it cools, to, if there's moisture there, you're going to get clouds, okay? And if there's enough moisture there, you're going to get really turbulence, okay? And you're going to get thunderstorms. So this is one way to get air lifting, and it can definitely bring clouds and severe weather. So, okay, and that's called a cyclone. Cool. Well, on to the next part. And I really toyed with, um, you know, trying to break this up and what do I want to cover next, and and I just kind of came came back around to the. Plugging ahead into the next part. Plugging ahead. So, part five. More about wind. <laughs> now it works. Oh my goodness. Okay, so wind. Now, in order to kind of take wind the next step further, I need to talk about these kind of um, different scales of wind. But in all of these small scale to large scale wind, wind is always air relocating from a low to a high pressure. Wind is always air relocating from a high to a low pressure. Sorry. Um, and kind of the theme that we just looked at, Wind is always air, re I said it wrong the first time. Wind is always air relocating from a high to a low pressure. I said it right the last time. <laughs> and it was kind of like I said, the tighter the isobars, the more you're falling off a cliff. Instead of you, if you have wide space isobars, you're like, oh, okay, you can take a leisurely sort of jump down the road. Okay. So the greater the difference, okay, that would be tight isobars, then the greater the, what we call the gradient, and the faster or stronger the wind. All right, so here we go. Um, large winds. And I have three, three sizes of winds. And when I say large, actually large also goes, um, oh, actually I'm starting with the small one, aren't I? Um, there are large, medium, and small. So from left to right, I have a figure here, starting with the small ones, okay? So the small ones are called micro scale. Micro scale, kind of like 
in uh, experiments. Sometimes you'll do a small scale, micro scale. Micro scale winds. Examples of micro scale winds are those little wind gusts that lift up debris or lift up uh, kind of that you see. Um, dust devils, if you've ever seen a dust devil, that's a small scale, micro scale wind. Now the thing about um, the, sm the size actually goes to how long it lasts. So the smallest ones last the shortest period. So these things don't last very long, okay? Then we take it up a notch to the middle scale winds, okay? Middle scale, actually instead of middle scale, it's called mesoscale. So I don't have this on my slide, but it's on my figure, so it's fair game. Mesoscale, these would be the middle ones. So kind of from left to right, we have small, medium and large. We have small, and then we have middle. So the middle ones, not only um, are they larger than the microscale, the mesoscale are larger, but they also last longer. Okay, so notice it's in yellow up here. How long do they last? Well, the middle ones can last um, from minutes to hours to days. Okay, so what do we mean by a wind that can last that long? Well, examples would be actually tornadoes. Moving, moving air in that way, thunderstorms. Um, I've got some slides here to talk about these sort of uh, middle-sized winds. And then last but not least, we have the large-scale winds. Um, the large-scale winds can be um, upwards to, it says large-scale winds are the size of several states. So the large scale winds are called macro scale winds, sometimes planetary scale winds, large scale winds, large. And they last longer. I mean, they can last um, days to weeks. Um, I don't know if we're going to get to it, but have you guys heard of El Nino and La Nina? I'm debating about covering that. But right now, the the... An El Nino can last for, um, I want to say, I want to say years. You know, it's several months into years, an El Nino. And right now, actually, that's being um, credited with our kind of weird sort of seasons we've been, kind of unseasonable weather we've been having. El Nino. Um, all right, so large-scale winds, we're going to talk about those. Have you ever heard of the... Um, the mid-latitude, have you ever heard of mid-latitude westerlies? Have you ever heard of westerly winds? How is that? Okay, good. Westerlies or westerly winds. Okay. That actually is, I'll grab our blow back here. Westerly winds are a nice, strong thing you can hang your hat on. Prevailing wind that is the size of, here's North America. Basically, the westerly winds are right here, kind of a band that go okay, like that. Um, so that's a large-scale wind. And large-scale winds are have this kind of twist to them, to the right in the northern hemisphere, okay, and to the, to the left in the southern hemisphere. So let's talk about a few of those middle or mesoscale winds. I kind of picked out a few of them to talk about. And some of these you might be familiar with. Um, have you ever, oh, I remember this one. Okay, so have you ever been in Chicago about 3 p.m. and felt that breeze come in off of Michigan, Lake Michigan? That's what this is, okay? It's a medium-sized wind, and it, and it works with oceans or large bodies of water like Lake Michigan, okay? Um, so actually, Lake Michigan, I know we kind of think of that afternoon breeze, okay, but it, actually there's another breeze that comes. The afternoon breeze would be like this. So we can just take it where it says uh, uh, colder seawater, and we can call that Lake Michigan. L. Michigan. And we didn't talk much about it, but are you okay with this? That um, if you have a swimming pool, like in the, I don't think we talked about it, this. The springtime, if you have a swimming pool, a large, um, you know, outdoor swimming pool, that it takes a while for it to go ahead and heat up. Like, you know, you can get it nice and warm um, days, but it's just a lag. Okay, water takes so long to heat up. 
So that's why this is saying actually we have um, your large body water, Lake Michigan, will generally stay colder. And if it stays colder, then um, it ends up with, remember we said that cold air generally has a higher pressure than warm air. So with that in mind, I'm going to put a letter H here for a high pressure. Okay. And that's kind of the beginning of this whole 3 p.m. lake breeze. Okay. If that's a high pressure, then, then over here, what the thing about land is it heats up more quickly. And so it's warmer. So I'm going to put a, um, uh, a low pressure over here okay, because it's warmer. So that actually is the reason for your wind, okay, about 3 p.m. Now notice it goes ahead and it creates, it, it kind of closes the circle. We generally have it going up and kind of coming down and descending. So but that actually is your incoming uh, breeze about 3 p.m. Then you may not be notice it as much. I, I probably haven't, <coughs> but it'd be fun to go take a road trip and see if this really happens. So then actually in the evening, okay, when things start to, when the sun is set, okay, what's going to happen again, and, and you can liken maybe this to your swimming pool again, is um, in the middle of summer when, you know, the sun is set and, you know, the outside temperatures are kind of cooler, your swimming pool retains its heat for a while. And that's exactly what the large bodies of water do, Lake Michigan would do. So as the sun has set, actually it stays warm out here. Okay, so that's a relatively low pressure, and the, um, your land cools down faster, and it makes a high pressure. So we actually have kind of these local breezes are good about, um, local or mesoscale breezes are great about kind of them coming in pairs. So we have an outgoing breeze, you know, I don't know what time that would be, maybe like 1, 2, 3 a.m. Okay, so we have an outgoing breeze um, in the evening. Okay, so that's one pair of, of medium scale winds. Here's another pair, pair of medium scale winds. Um, so they both have to do with basically you have a mountain, you have kind of a pair of mountains, and between the mountains you have a valley. Okay, so we have mountain, mountain, valley. So um, the way this works is, um, like it says in the daytime, what will happen is that um, the up here will get hotter than here in the daytime. I must have one more slide. Down. No. Oh, it's on the next one. And then because of that, it's on the next one. So because of that, this ends up with a low pressure and this is a high pressure. Okay, and there you go. It's a valley breeze. Okay, so the next one goes with this. Actually then, when at nighttime, the conditions change. Okay, so at nighttime, at upper latitudes, you're more susceptible to it cooling down more quickly because actually the air is thinner up there. And so as it cools down, it ends up with um, a high pressure up here and a low pressure down here. So it's air going down, mountain breeze. I guess you just get used to it. Okay. So I want to introduce you to something that's going to carry on into Friday's lecture, I know. Okay. So the biggest sort of wind is called a macro scale uh, or planetary scale wind. It's just big, right? The westerlies is a big wind, and that's actually we're kind of leading up to the westerlies. Um, so I complain... They call this the three cell model. This totally drives me nuts because to me, there, there's, I'm going to try to convince you that there's actually, so here's North America, there's, there's kind of a, a cell that goes here all the way around the Earth, okay? A cell that goes, let me see, here, we're in this one, we're in the middle one, okay? 
goes all the way around the Earth, and the cell that goes up here. Okay, so that's, where's the equator? One, two, three. Okay, but there's three down here. There's one, two, three down here. So I get it as a six cell model. I'm just saying. I've never seen it as the six cell model, but I think it should be. So we have three in our hemisphere, three in the southern hemisphere. I suppose I'll have to live with that. So you kind of saw me break it up a little bit where I kind of went. I tried to find the equator, and I tried to kind of guess where maybe 30 degrees is, 30 degrees latitude, and I tried to draw a band like that, okay? And I tried to guess where 30 and 60 was and draw a band like that, and 60 and 90 and draw a band like that. So that's your three cells, okay? So we could actually, if I wanted to, we could take a marker, and we could write um, Hadley cell right here, and we could write feral cell right here, and we could write polar cell up here. Now, remember, they go all the way around the Earth. Okay, we could do that, and we would be justified to do that. So kind of what I've described is summarized in this figure. So if we just focus on the northern hemisphere, now you can see the six cells. See why I complain, okay? So just focus on the northern hemisphere, okay? Um... This was the first cell next to the equator. This is the second cell next to, actually, we're in the second cell. We're in the feral cell. And then this is the third cell, the polar cell. Okay. And the, the whole thing about sort of these sort of, uh, these things, we'll kind of talk more about it. But what it's trying to do is to kind of show you kind of the, how it, this is the Earth and kind of how it responds kind of almost in three dimensions. Okay, so we must have one more thing to say about that. Okay, so my hint is that air flowing within these cells generally move um, vertically. So all I mean by um, at the edges and horizontally between. Well, I don't know what I mean by that. Okay, but I'll try to explain the three dimensions of it um, Friday. Now, before we leave though, remember we talked about the, the four layers of the Earth's atmosphere? Okay, the bottom layer is the troposphere, right? And so this slide is referring to that. This slide says that these cells that we're going to talk about um, the Hadley cell, the feral cell, and the polar cell, they're all confined basically to the troposphere. All right, that's a good place to stop. So we'll see you tomorrow next door.